as a concession to communism. But as Ed Lazarus points out, the public wants defense cuts. A plurality agreed with the statement that we can cut our nuclear weapons arsenal in half without harming our national security. A majority favored reducing the number of nuclear weapons in the arsenal. The implications of this to the presidential race are profound. A budget compromise may buy time, but does not break the economic logjam. The difficulty in cutting federal spending is primarily political. What makes the new poll interesting is that the conventional political... Hello, and uh, we have another treat today. Our guest speaker is, is Nils Nelson, Chairman of Computer Science Department. And, and uh, if you thought there was interesting things on the desk last week, uh, you should see what's on the desk this week. Thanks, Don. Just to get us in the right mood, I brought a couple of things that I hope the television camera can pick up. Uh, we got that. All right, so some of you who are photography buffs in the audience will recognize that as an Edward Weston uh, print of a um, snail shell. Actually, it's probably a little difficult to see the quality of the image over the television, but imagine uh, very lustrous tones and uh, high quality, and people who are interested in this can come up afterwards and see it. And I've got another one also, uh, which is an Ansel Adams uh, print entitled Aspens in New Mexico. You might ask, what does all this have to do with writing? And I'm interested in making some connections, at least at the very beginning of the class today, between writing and art. Now, of course, writing novels and writing plays, poetry, etc., certainly regarded as an art form. And so uh, those kinds of people have no problem uh, identifying themselves as artists. But what I'd like to uh, stress today is that mathematical writing really should be considered as art also. And so just how does that uh, come about? What does this sort of thing have to do with mathematical writing? Well, <clears throat> writing can be art and it can be communicating, but I think it's probably not communicating to the extent that it could unless it's done uh, with the same kind of passion, say, that the artist has for the artistic things that the artist uh, produces. And just as artists uh, have various materials at their disposal, uh, for example, in, in painting, uh, colors and palettes and in music, uh, other materials, I think one of the things that unifies a lot of uh, arts has to do with the phrase composition and what composition is all about. And of course, composition is a word that we can apply equally well to writing. I suppose if Don Knuth were to give some examples of uh, artistic things, and maybe he has already in this class, uh, he might uh, play some musical pieces for you. Now, there's a, an, a photography teacher uh, that I had one time, because the reason for my using photographs instead of organ music is that I've, I've been interested in photography as a hobby. Um, and a photography teacher that I had one time gave the following definition of composition. He said that composition was equal to organization plus simplification. And he was thinking about photography, so he was thinking about uh, scenes such as this Edward Weston scene in which uh, one can't say that's a complicated picture and uh, it's well organized. He was probably thinking of things like this uh, Ansel Adams scene in which there's a forest back there but it's difficult to see on the television but certain things are highlighted so there's a certain organization uh, to it in a certain composition. Now, I think the uh, definition that composition is organization plus simplification applies equally well to writing. And so I want to mention a few things about that. By the way, I've, as Don says, I did bring along a lot of ephemera today, but I'd like nevertheless for all of this to be uh, very informal. And as people come up with questions, uh, let's have some discussion as we go along. I might not get through all of this even. Um, there was another quote about composition that Edward Weston, as long as I'm showing an Edward, Edward Weston picture, uh, mentioned, and that is that composition is the strongest way of seeing. Now, that's one of these typical artistic kinds of phrases, right? You're not too sure what does that mean. And uh, it can mean a lot of different things to different people. Uh, I'm not sure what it means to Edward Weston. 
but I have a guess as to uh, the sort of thing I think it might have meant uh, to him and, and what it means to me. Uh, in a way, that phrase anticipates perhaps some modern work in computer vision in which people who are doing research in machine vision understand that vision requires the active participation of the viewer. The viewer has to be very involved in the process constructing models as uh, he sees the scene. And so the viewer, in a certain sense, must organize and must simplify, must be involved in this composition process in order to see clearly. And it's when he sees that the most clearly that he's seeing it most strongly, I suppose Weston would say. And um, so I'm not so sure that uh, uh, when Weston looked through the ground glass, when he really saw something that he would say wow about, it's because he was able to frame a particular part of nature, whatever he was photographing, in a way which organizes it and simplifies it. And therefore, uh, that photographer sees best during uh, when it's composed well. So I think the same sort of thing uh, can be said for writing, that uh, one has to take a look at what it is you're writing about, and you're not actually showing that through writing exactly as it is. You're showing it highlighting and emphasizing certain kinds of things, and uh, that's the artistic part of it, I suppose. Um, here's another quote. I have various quotes to uh, illustrate some things in this uh, talk. Life is very nice, but it lacks form. It's the aim of art to give it some. So that's what we have to do in our writing also. Now, one of the other parts of thinking of writing as an art is that, uh, like a lot of other kinds of artistic processes, it's fun. Now, that might not have struck all of you yet. I suppose there are some of you in the audience for whom writing is already fun. Some of it probably, some people probably regard it as a bit of a chore. But when it's done at its best, I think it's an enjoyable sort of thing to be doing. And just as other artists, painters, for example, have a sort of sense of um, pleasure smelling paints and oils and photographers, some photographers say, gee, it's really great getting in the dark room and smelling all of that hyposulfite and so on. Uh, I think writers have a sense of enjoyment and thrill uh, when they are engaged with some of the tools of, of their trade, whether it be looking up references or whatever your favorite way of getting ideas down on paper or into some medium might be. It might be scratching with a small pencil. You just have a nice feel about handling that pencil after a while when it gets to be fun, right? And, or it might be an old typewriter or some word processing system. It's kind of fun to sit down at the keyboard and you know how to type, uh, let the keyboard go. So I think there's a certain joy in writing uh, that comes about just from even mastering some of the craft aspects of it and uh, also uh, acquiring the craft and sitting down and, and writing. Now, one of the main things that I'll talk about today is really sort of the craft of writing, and I guess that's one of the main things that's been talked about in this class. I've seen some of the notes that have been handed out. There's a good deal of stress on craft, and I don't know whether or not uh, people can say a lot about writing as an art except to say that it ought to be one. Um, the craft part comes in in that if it's going to be an art, you really have to master the craft. You can't let the craft of it get in the way any more than a photographer can be sitting there thinking about f-stops all the time when he or she should be composing things. And so there is a stress on craft, and it's important, but there's a level above that. The reason for the stress on craft is so that can all be automatic. So some of the things that I'll talk about today deal more with the craft of writing. And some of it might be a bit repetitious because there's already been some very good notes handed out and some very good speakers uh, talking about the craft of writing. So mine is going to be kind of a broad brush overview of those aspects of the craft that I've found important in things that I've done. Also, I might be a little bit autobiographical, which I guess I get to be, uh, and I hope that that's going to be of, uh, of some interest to people. So I would like to start by uh, listing some number of of uh, phrases that I think help organize uh, the material I want to talk about writing. Uh, one thing to say, which is not too late for uh, all of you looking over the class, is to start early in the process of uh, learning about writing and doing it. That uh, this is the sort of thing which uh, comes best, I guess, when minds are still a bit young and impressionable. And so get started very early. And looking back over some of the things that um, I've done, I noticed, I was looking through some old uh, files of mine, and I noticed that I took a class here at Stanford in 1954 called Scientific Writing. I don't know that such a kind of course is given these days, except 
by people like Don Knuth. Uh, maybe uh, it's not given in the English department anymore. There was a, a great English instructor that I had, who may still be here for all I know, whose name was Levin. And uh, we had to write various things, and um, sort of an essay a week, or two essays a week, or something like that. And he looked at them from the standpoint of uh, how clear they were, and how well organized they were. And I remember having to write a term paper, which I wrote, I have here, called Ionic Oscillations, something I was interested in, apparently, as a, I was a um, senior then at Stanford. And he, uh, I ended up getting an A minus. I was very happy about that, because previous experiences that I had had in writing uh, composition at Stanford as sophomore English, freshman English, I'd gotten C's and maybe a B minus. So this is really the first A kind of grade that I'd gotten writing. So anyway, if you've gotten C's or B's in English before, don't worry. The A's are ahead of you. You just have to work at it. Anyway, he says about this that, um, he says, it's not, uh, not only have you eliminated most of your stylistic difficulties, except for some weak punctuation, see, so you gotta keep working on the punctuation. Um, but uh, he said I used visual aids effectively and so on and so forth. So that was uh, sort of a promising start. I think it's important as you go along to get yourself into situations where you do get rewarded. Right? So um, work hard in this class, get an A or an A minus, right? and then you'll start the process snowba snowballing of, um, of, of getting started on writing. Another thing I noticed when, that Don Knuth handed out is he had some very interesting material about uh, filling in the blanks between equations, right? Just don't put one equation after another. Sort of tell a little story about uh, how one equation got to be the other equation. So I was looking through my thesis, and I don't know that I did this exactly as Don would uh, have recommended or not, but uh, just as an example of some of that, this is more, this is given more to, to show that I recognize these kinds of things now and might not have exactly then, but a little hard to see. Anyway, this is a bunch of integral things here. Integral signs, equation 3.3. And then it says, equation 3.3 can be written in the form of an iterated integral. See, so you're sort of getting the reader used to the idea you're going to bring this integral sign over to here. Um, since integration is a linear operation, the expectation operator, which is um, <coughs> these brackets around the whole thing, uh, can pass through the integral sign to act on the random variable and so on and so forth. These implications lead to the following equation, and you click on the following equation. So uh, I was happy that um, looking at what Don was talking about in the notes to this class appeared to be uh, something I'd, I'd tried to master anyway back in, uh, that was 1958. Uh, another thing about writing is that I think some people get an urge or almost a compulsion to have to write rather early on. So I think, I can't say how you are to go about getting that compulsion, right? If you don't have it, maybe you don't have it. But uh, give, um, let it take over if you have it and, uh, and, and start in doing some things. Uh, after leaving Stanford, I was in the Air Force for a while and for some reason or another, I got this wild idea that I ought to write a book about radar. And here I was, 26 years old or something like that. There were some books about radar out. Why did I think that I should go write a book about radar? But it was this compulsion to try to organize the material and understand it. Because I was just beginning to see how some things would come together in radar signal processing. So I thought the, a neat thing to do would be to just go off and try to write this book. And I brought along uh, some of the manuscript here. I had a, an outline which was somewhere around 1960 of uh, things I was going to do. And then I, there's some various manuscript pages which don't come across on the television. But anyway, I got started. Um, thinking about writing books uh, quite early. And as a matter of fact, this never did see the light of day, this particular book. I, I did it while I was in the Air Force. And I got out of the Air Force, got interested in some other things at SRI, namely in uh, neural networks and what today would be called connectionism, I suppose. And so I just abandoned this book on radar. But nevertheless, I learned quite a bit in writing it. It organized a lot of material for me that I think has been helpful. Um, okay, well. The next, besides starting early, which you're all doing, the next thing has to do with writing and rewriting and rewriting and rewriting and rewriting. And I suppose everybody has told you this over and over and over, and you probably all agree with it by now. But it really is true. I mean, you just cannot get by with, um, with a first draft. And I suppose there are different traditions in music. I've heard that Mozart could put out a, 
uh, symphony or a piece and pretty much the first draft would be it. I don't know whether that's apocryphal or whether that's true, but the Beethoven labored and labored and labored over things. I think writing is more of the sort of Beethoven sort of style. You have a question? Certainly, uh, Robert Heinlein claimed in a speech to Annapolis graduating class one year that you, one of the secrets of writing, being a professional writer is you must resist rewriting what you have written. He did say that, huh? Well, he does pretty good stuff. So it might be that this is, uh, this is advice, you know, maybe this advice isn't universally applicable, but in... For the other 99% of us. And I'm in that, I'm sure in that uh, category. There are little slogans about that, too. Somebody said that. I wasn't able to find out the source of the quote. <laughs> and so you're going to have to do a lot of the work so that your reader doesn't. Matter of fact, this was maybe a little more color, colorfully said by Ernest Hemingway, which <laughs> we won't leave on the screen too long. <laughs> okay. So I think you have to be prepared to throw away uh, most of what you write. That um, writing, at least in the early stages, has to be considered pretty much like working drawings of an artist. You've seen in art exhibits um, little sketches called studies, right? This was a study of this particular painter to get ready to do such and such. And I suppose the same thing holds true in music. And I think you have to sort of think of a lot of your early writing as being studies. You're just kind of getting ready to think about it. And that uh, you're probably going to throw all that stuff away. Uh, don't feel badly about um, doing it because these studies are aids to making an outline. And you'll make the outline. And then you'll throw that stuff away, but now you have a little better outline. And you can sort of start and uh, do that again. Um, another thing about writing and rewriting and rewriting is that you're not done just when your uh, book is finished. And so you still have to rewrite. And so that, uh, there's this book I wrote, Principles of Artificial Intelligence. See where some of my ephemera has escaped to. It's out of order here. And um, you get letters from people after you publish um, saying, well, you basically an excellent book and so on. But I found an ambiguity in a notation, et cetera, et cetera, on page 37, you see. So you have to go look at that and see, uh, well, maybe there are some things that could be improved. And um, I got a letter from a famous person in computer science, uh, Maurice Carnot. And uh, so he wrote up this little note for me, talking about a counterexample in my A star algorithm. And he constructed a little graph and said that if I actually use the search algorithm A star exactly as said in the algorithm on this example, the wrong thing would happen. Well, Maurice Carnot was pretty smart, and he did find a counterexample all right. And so then the next edition, you have to be prepared to make those kinds of corrections, which I did. As a matter of fact, uh, right away after putting out the, uh, this book, Principles of Artificial Intelligence, let's see, we'll show that here, right? <laughs> right after putting that book out, uh, we put out a little errata sheet that had some of the errors that we caught. And then uh, what happened with this book, this is an interesting book, Principles of Artificial Intelligence, because I was led to believe that just because I had all of the text uh, online, that it wouldn't be at all that difficult a matter to publish it myself. So I set up a little publishing company, my wife and I did, and uh, called the Tioga Publishing Company, and we just published it. And so one of the advantages of publishing a book yourself, which I don't recommend, but one of the advantages is that you can very easily make changes to it. So in the next printing, you can take out those pages and make the corrections and then make sure that the next printing uh, has the corrections in it. Uh, just as a little sidelight, about uh, publishing. Uh, my wife was a great deal of help on that. She's here in the back of the room. And uh, she's now actually got excited about the publishing business and decided to become a publisher full time. And I'm not anymore. So she's really taken over the Tioga Publishing Company that doesn't publish technical books at all anymore. It um, publishes books about nature and the environment. Anyway, we had this book and we published it. So now it's a matter of selling it. So I ended up. Uh, putting up a little brochure. And then it had an outline of, of all the things in the book and bought a mailing list and we just sent it out. So I was pretty vertically integrated 
from actually writing all of these things to, uh, to trying to get it published. The uh, next thing that I would say, I'm not going to, I don't have any ephemera to illustrate this point, and I suppose other people might have said this too, but you have to read a lot also that you have to, uh, in order to pick up some of the craft, in order to uh, sharpen your own style, in order to be able to get your critical mind working. Uh, you have to do a lot of reading. And I just don't know any writers who are very good writers who don't uh, read an awful lot. Uh, the next thing has to do with having a good model of the reader. And this has to really be stressed. I think it's perhaps an obvious point, but there's more to having a model of the reader than just briefly considering what the reader might uh, be able to understand. And you have to really put yourself in the reader or the listener's uh, shoes try to understand uh, what it is, what sort of vocabulary the reader has, what kinds of things the reader has already understood, what are the primitives that the reader deals with, how you can express what you want to say in terms of those primitives. And it's more than, um, this, the situation is complex enough that I think you have to operationalize having a model of the reader by having a whole lot of what we would in computer science would call demons. You have to have these little demons working all the time. And as you're writing, whether it's by pencil or typing things in, these little demons have to be running. And they have to be criticizing what you're doing. Not criticizing in a way that sort of um, paralyzes you from writing. I mean, you're not the stern uh, critic saying, you dummy, how come you're writing this thing? The reader can't understand it. But the sort of critic that's friendly. And you just have to have a lot of those, thousands of them, I suppose. And they're sort of operating all the time. They have to be automatic. and. Uh, there have to be trying to figure out the way the reader is going to screw up in understanding that, right? The reader is going to think this pronoun refers to that in some uh, very low-level sense. So the reader is going to think that um, uh, this is what I'm saying, or the model is this. And these critics sort of figuring out the ways in which the reader is going to misunderstand things. I think that's the kind of model I'm trying to get across. Try to figure out how the reader is going to misunderstand things. And then, your writing can act to try to correct that. So you then insert into the writing ways to force the reader into the understanding you want the reader to have. So that he's not allowed to wander off and understand it this way or understand it that way. You have to predict all these possible ways he may misunderstand it so you can block those ways. You have to consciously block them uh, with additional writing. I think that's best done by developing these demons. And to the, uh, the only way I know of to develop demons is just by practice. I mean, this has to be a motor skill, almost. Right? It's like playing tennis or something. And you have to have done an awful lot of it uh, in order to uh, be able to do it. You can't really read through Don Knuth's rules or uh, E.B. White's rules or anybody else's rules, and then as you're writing, sort of go down the list of rules. Those things have to be absolutely memorized and, and memorized in a, the part of your brain that sort of is a motor skill, I think. Uh, OK. But yet, that, another reason for having to make it automatic is you don't want writing to be compulsive, right? It's supposed to be fun. And if you're thinking all the time, how is the reader screwing up? If you're too conscious about all that, then it might take a bit of the joy of it away. And so if it's in the background and part of the craft, uh, then perhaps um, your writing style doesn't become too compulsive. So besides having a model of the reader, we have to master the medium itself, which I suppose I'm talking about in all of these things having to do with the craft. But uh, mastering the medium has more, there's more to it than just English style. I mean, the English language or the French language or whatever language you're going to write in. You have to really know that. Uh, the vocabulary has to be adequate to the task. However, it doesn't necessarily have to consist of all long words. I mean, simple writing is, uh, read Mark Twain, for example, uh, not all that many big words in, in his writing, but it has to be adequate to the task. And, um, <coughs> But there's more than just learning the English language. You have to learn some of the things that are important in technical writing, the use of illustrations, graphs, indices, tables, and um, those sorts of things. And uh, learn when an illustration is important, instead of trying to say it in a visual form, uh, when the illustration is really important. Typography, I think Don Knuth in the notes for today mentioned that one of the reasons that he, was, uh, he had handed out this um, 
section from Genesis in my book, uh, Logical Foundations of AI, has to do with the fact that um, we could use typography to make some important distinctions we wanted to make. So we were talking about, we're using and talking about many different languages in this, this book. There's English, sort of mathematical formulas describing the meta theory of a language, the predicate calculus. The TV. There's a Paul Clay. I'm not so sure we're supposed to reproduce that Paul Clay picture like this without official permission from the Museum of Modern Art. Uh, but anyway, there it goes. <laughs> um, uh, let's see a page of this. Let's see if the television camera can narrow in on um, this section right here. You see now, um, maybe, uh, yeah. Now, uh, that's interesting because you see there's mathematical formulas we're using, mathematical notation, this delta. There are what we're calling schema variables, which is the uh, mathematical italic P. There's the uh, logical symbols uh, here. There are expressions in the language for all P star, and we used a typewriter font. That This P is a sort of typewriter font for that. And I noticed that, um, I can't tell you, I don't have my glasses on. Is that a lowercase p over here compared to this uppercase p? No. It isn't. OK. I thought maybe we found a mistake. So uh, the use of special conventions like that is going to be important. Now, I think there's going to be something very interesting that you folks are going to have to deal with a lot more than Don and I are uh, going to have to deal with. And that is that there are new media coming along for writing. There's going to be very interactive media. So all of this stuff about the media lab and Nicholas Negroponte isn't all hype. I mean, some of that is probably true, that we're going to be writing in very interactive uh, forms that will engage the reader in interaction. And uh, now, we're not sure exactly just what sorts of mechanisms are going to be important there. Right? The Macintosh has played around with a certain set of mechanisms for um, user interaction these things called dialogue boxes, right, a number of other things. Computer scientists will invent more of these. Uh, that has to kind of stabilize out. It isn't clear yet how important uh, some of those things are. Remember, the index didn't get invented uh, right away with, with writing. It took a while before people thought it was a good idea to have an index and, separate, and to separate things into chapters. And all of these inventions took several hundred years, right, or more, thousands, uh, to stabilize into a form which is very useful for us. And now we're going to be developing these authoring systems that allow us to write things that are um, more useful, say, than textbooks that engage the reader. We're not sure yet just what the stable points in these authoring, um, in these kinds of programs will be, what sorts of things will be useful. But people who are going to use that medium will have to try to do their best to uh, grasp whatever uh, techniques work out the best there. Um, so mastering the medium is also a point that involves having a lot of demons. Right? There are certain kinds of things that should be just automatic. Not only demons about understanding the uh, reader, but demons about the craft and skill of writing. It should jar when you see a split infinitive. I mean, when you read something, right, and there's a split infinitive, although I suppose opinions differ on that these days, whether it should jar or not. But it jars me. I mean, I can't, I sort of, when I scan across the page and I see a split infinitive, it sort of lights up in red at me. And that should be automatic because then when you're writing that way, you'll change it. You should, it should jar when you see somebody use a which when the author should have used it that and vice versa. I mean, that should actually stand out and, and bother you. And, uh, and then if it does, you'll be get, uh, more used to doing the right thing yourself. And again, the only thing I can say about that is practice. So the next thing I wanted to mention, this number, six, master the material. By the way, I'm not going to have 10 of these. There's only going to be nine, so it's not going to be the 10. It isn't Nielsen's 10 commandments. <laughs> um, well, this is pretty obvious. But there are some things I want to say about that, uh, mastering the material that you're writing about. Because a lot of mastering the material has to do with the process of writing itself. Now, a lot of people think 
that you go from some internal model in your head and you go through this writing process and out comes text, you see, and that's it. But the uh, situation is a lot less linear than that. The very process of writing causes you to reorganize. It's sort of a different way of thinking it. it. involves the whole thinking process. And that brings me back to the point I made earlier that you should regard a lot of your writing as just studies that you uh, use for preparing your, your own mind. So it helps you build up this internal uh, model. There's several different ways to learn material. Actually, you have to learn the material and have it in the internal model uh, before you can write about it. There are several different ways to learn that material. You can read, which you've got to do. You can go to a course, sit in, listen to lectures. Uh, you can write about it. And better yet, you can get up and speak about it because after all, um, a similar sort of thing goes on in speaking, I think, in trying to understand material. If you have this internal model, you speak, and you, there's more of an effect than just on the listener. There's an effect on you. Now, I've noticed that I'd prepare a lecture, basically um, reading material and writing some things. And I'd get up there in front of a class just like this. And I'd begin to pre-rehearse what I was going to say. And although it seemed perfectly clear in writing, I mean, it was absolutely true. It was in Times Roman and everything. And I'd think of myself saying it. I mean, I don't even believe that. <laughs> and you find yourself uh, really going through, I think you use a different part of the brain, maybe. And so the process of speaking is also very important in giving a lecture and explaining it to somebody. And, uh, and then you got to integrate that with the writing, because that feeds back into um, what you're writing about. So writing is certainly a way of thinking, and you have to saturate yourself in the subject matter of um, what you're writing about. You should certainly never let something be published without other people reading it and critiquing it. I mean, one of the nice things about writing in a community of scholars, for example, as at Stanford, is that you can show something to a friend down the hall. Of course, you have to be very careful at what stage you show it. If you really have a good friend who will read just about everything you write, show it all the time. If they're only going to read it once, you have to decide when are you going to read that, you know, use that resource. Early in the process, you're going to let this person critique and then you're going to throw it away. Well, it depends on, you know, when that person's going to do you the most good. But uh, I would never think of publishing anyth anything whatsoever without sending things out to um, uh, have it reviewed. For example, in this Principles of Artificial Intelligence book, uh, the process that I used in trying to learn this stuff, because I didn't really know it until I wrote it. In fact, it might not be, I don't really know it now anymore. But, uh, the process that I used, I always tried to be teaching an artificial intelligence course during the time I was writing the whole thing. So I'd persuade Stanford to let me teach a course. And one time I visited the University of Massachusetts and I taught a course there. So I'd be teaching a course on the whole book. But then in addition to that, I'd try to teach a course on that chapter that I was writing right then so I could get much more intensively involved in that, hand out notes, expect the students to catch me in errors and things of that sort. So uh, and that process works pretty well. You certainly wouldn't, I wouldn't, rec I, I mean, you shouldn't write a technical book without teaching it. It's absolutely a ridiculous thing to even try to inflict a book out on the world without having gotten up and, and giving it in a class, it seems to me. Um, so this, what I've been saying is summarized pretty well, I think, by this, uh, this quote. In a very real sense, the writer writes in order to teach himself, to understand himself. The publishing of his ideas, though it brings gratifications, is a curious anticlimax. So the actual finished product, uh, you find a lot of writers saying that after it's done. Well, that was nice, but that's kind of a byproduct. What you really got out of it was um, learning it yourself. You have to keep the, shouldn't take that too much to heart because you've got to keep the reader in mind all the time. I mean, you're not only doing this to educate yourself, but you've got to do it in a way which educates the reader, and that way you're also going to educate yourself best. Okay. Now, the next thing that I want to stress is uh, the simplification part. We talked about composition being organization and simplification. And simplification means a lot of things. And the first thing it means is don't, don't be compulsive about having to tell the truth. Lie. 
uh, because what you're really trying to do is to get the reader involved. If the reader knows you're lying, it's not really a sin. But what I mean by that is you say something reasonably simple at first. You know and the reader knows that it's not the whole truth. It just kind of establishes connection between you and the reader. It's something that you can build on. You elaborate it later and you add later all the Rococo and, and other embellishments, right? But the very first thing has to be something very, very simple that people understand is, 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 is possibly a lie. Um, one example of that, I think, comes up very importantly in writing about computers, especially about computer programs, computer systems. Uh, I think Ted Shortliff did a marvelous job in his book about Meissen, clearly written and all of that. But uh, I think now, with the benefit of hindsight, we can go back to Ted Shortliff's book and say, well, now how should he have done it? I think what he should have done, and I think this is probably good advice for explaining a lot of computer systems, is to invent some artificial system, not Meissen, which is what the book was writing about, but something you might call mini Meissen. Something that's not quite a Meissen, maybe a long way from a Meissen, but it has some of the key ideas, the essential features. And you try to explain that just as clearly as you can, and then elaborate it and say, by the way, uh, we actually had these things called, besides Meissen being a backward chaining theorem prover, right? Explain that in some detail. We had these things called certainty factors. Then start talking about certainty factors. And if you get too early talking about all the property lists and the way the Lisp code worked and so on, um, I think that's uh, a danger. So you have to simplify. Uh, examples, extremely important in simplifying. I think Jeff, uh, according to Don, mentioned some things about examples uh, last week, and I heartily agree. Examples are very, very difficult to come up with. You have to really try very hard to find the simplest example that bears the, most of the burden of what you're trying to say. The 80-20 rule comes into play there. If you can get 80% of the truth across, or even a little less, I'd settle for less, actually, uh, with a 20% difficulty in terms of thinking of an example, do that. Settle for that. And then elaborate. You can always elaborate later. Now, mathematicians have a tendency not to want to do that. Right? They want to state their theorem in its most general form. I mean, after all, uh, why say some things about this particular case in three dimensions when you can state it in n, uh, et cetera, et cetera? Well, that's fine, but there are certain cases in which probably the mathematician didn't think of it initially in n dimensions. The mathematician probably thought of it in a simple case. You see, worked out all the proof, the sketch of how it went, convinced himself or herself that it was right, all the intuition and so forth, then denies the reader that very same intuition by lifting it up to the general level and making it all very, in his mind, say, elegant. And uh, so in my view, the mathematical writing, uh, not to say that you should, in the end, not have that elegant thing there, but you have to pay some attention, I think, to making sure the reader is with you and making it a little less painful on the part of the reader, really giving the reader understanding. Maybe state it for some simple cases first, and then later generalize it. Some of the generalization, in fact, can even be relegated to appendices, I think. So thinking of examples is very uh, an arduous process. And you have to sort of collect them. As you're writing a textbook, uh, examples will come to you. And you decide to substitute one example for another because it actually illustrates the point better. So you sort of ratchet up on your progress by um, having some examples that you're willing to go with. But then as you hear another one, slip that one out or save it for an exercise or something like that and put in a simpler one. Now, with the advent of word processors, I think there's another important piece of advice about writing, and that is to avoid recycling. It's awfully easy to borrow a piece from this paper and slip it into this book or borrow a piece from some memo that you were writing. Full blown, there's all this stuff and it comes with all the tech commands and everything right there still and then put it into the book. And uh, you see, one thing that robs you of the experience of rewriting it because you'd probably think of it a little differently. You wrote this thing perhaps three years ago, right? Now you're gonna put it in a, in a book or something. And you think, gee, I, I remember writing that stuff. I'll just use the same text. Well, lots of things have changed. Maybe the preliminary material that you'd introduced had changed a little bit. The notation had changed. Uh, also, having the chance to write it all over again from scratch, you might actually think of something a little bit differently. So I don't follow this advice about avoiding recycling as, uh, all the time. I'm probably guilty of doing a bit of that. 
But I think probably you should try to avoid the temptation to do it. Just uh, be eager for the opportunity to write it over again and, uh, and try to see how it looks. By the way, the writing it over again, there's nothing lost in doing that. After really wrestling with it and trying to write it as best you can, again, you can always go back and use the older stuff if you decide that you like that better, really. I don't think artists recycle material too much, do they? Maybe musicians occasionally uh, borrow a theme and elaborate on it later. Um, see, I'm, I'm not getting through all my ephemera here, so let me take just a little bit of uh, uh, time and uh, mention some of the things in this stack. Um, when I, after abandoning the radar book, coming to SRI, I got very interested in pattern recognition in neural networks. But I still had this compulsion, it was left over, I guess, from radar, of writing a book. And I was beginning to understand, I thought, what was going on with neural networks and some pattern recognition techniques. And I had this, I was at that stage where I knew I would crystallize my understanding a lot better if I sat down and wrote about it. So I decided, somewhat brashly, here I was, 28 probably at this time, uh, that, well, I need to write a book on this. So I arranged to give a class at Stanford. Blue might not show up very well on the television, but anyway, these were lecture notes. EE 353, they called it in those days. And it was a course that I uh, called Learning Machines. It was given in the summer of, uh, whatever that was, 1960, 62. Uh, okay, I was 29. And that was kind of fun to put that together. Um, I got all excited about uh, neurons, and I started writing about neurons and how there were dendrites and axons and bodies of cells and things of that sort, and explained all of that in the book. And then I started talking about mathematic, mathematical versions of neurons, and there were these connectionist-like diagrams. See, the connectionists are, are doing all this stuff again. And um, these, the connectionists, we now call these guys the hidden units. And uh, I guess we call them some middle layer or something like that. And uh, <coughs> so this says a mathematical treatment of um, neural net pattern classifiers. So I went through a lot of that and um, gave the class, and that was a lot of fun. The book didn't turn out exactly this way. I threw most of this stuff away. Well, I really put it in this file where I found it uh, over the weekend to use here today. But uh, all that stuff about neurons never appeared in the final book, uh, which was published in 1961, called Learning Machines. It's out of print now. It was published by McGraw-Hill. But um, I noticed, I've heard from some of the people in connectionism that, um, that it gets referenced occasionally, and people still use uh, some of the ideas in here. And so that was kind of fun to write that book. And that was really my first book. Pretty thin, right? Here I was writing a book came out and I thought, geez, is that skinny? And, uh, but <laughs> it took a lot of work. I threw a lot of stuff away and by the time I got to page, uh, whatever this was, 129, I thought, well, that's about all I have to say about that. And so, <laughs> no reason necessarily to go on and on and on. <laughs> and uh, so that was that. It was a pretty thin book. I remember my father saying, that's a pretty thin book, all right. <laughs> but, um, Anyway, it, it, isn't a, it, isn't all that, it isn't all that bad. Um, then uh, we were talking just a little bit before class about how one develops almost an addiction to this sort of thing, you see. And then some time went by, a few years, I hadn't written a book lately, so I had to get started again. And so um, I got interested in uh, a book on artificial intelligence. Meanwhile, I was learning other things than statistics. See, this, this book had to do with pattern classification, statistics, things of that sort. So I got interested in some things that uh, are a little more related to computer science and programming and LISP and problem solving methods. And in those days, there were big arguments between some of the people at MIT who were doing what they called heuristic programming and the people like Frank Rosenblatt who was building perceptrons. And so um, it looked to me like the stuff Minsky and those guys were doing was really probably the way to go in, in building artificial intelligence systems rather than these perceptron things. And so I started learning about that. And uh, again, it was uh, a little difficult to make sense out of the whole thing. 
was reading some articles by um, <clears throat> Minsky and Galerter and Newell Shaw and Simon and so on. And the role of search certainly seemed to be pretty important. And I was learning also a little bit about logic, and that seemed to be important. So I wrote this book called Problem Solving Methods in Artificial Intelligence. And it talked a bit about logic and search. And we had done some things on search algorithms. And in the meantime, we'd written some papers. And some of the results of those papers found their way into this book. It's a little thicker. My father's a little happier now, but not all that much thicker. And it was, uh, it was fun to do. But again, lots of stuff got thrown away first. Well, that was 197, that was 19, uh, what was that, 1971. This was 65, this is 71, six years. So about 76 comes along, and I have this urge again to write a book. And so I learned some more things about artificial intelligence. And so I decided, well, I'd make up this outline. This was in the uh, summer of, seven, oh, this is December of 76, but I think I started in the summer of 76. And I was going to call it Problem Solving Systems, and I made an outline. And I um, wrote up a bunch of stuff, notes and notes. More out There's a whole bunch of notes that I saved for some reason or another. And, uh, and then I'd make a new outline and throw this stuff away. So that gets chucked out. Here's a new outline. Um, more stuff. And pretty soon I called it Artificial Intelligence, a Framework. I didn't like that title very much. Part one, introduction. I was going to divide it up into parts. There's going to be part one, introduction. Part two, something else. And so I wrote all that junk up, teaching a course in the meantime. Uh, one of these courses was, was given at Amherst. And so then I threw all that stuff away. Little bits you'd save, sort of ideas and so forth. See, I was using a computer by then to write on. Um, this, these two books got written in longhand with a, on yellow pads. And uh, as a matter of fact, the um, Problem Solving Methods book got typed up by a secretary. And I decided that if uh, letting a colleague read it was a good idea, probably it was even better to just print it up, send out 100 of them. So I had SRI print up a bunch of them. And we sent out 100 to all and sundry. And I had hand-drawn diagrams and flowcharts and things like that. But got a lot of good, useful comments out of that. But uh, so by this time, I was using a computer for the principles of AI book. And ultimately, out of all that, came uh, this Principles of Artificial Intelligence book. And um, it, as I mentioned, it all got on, on online. And I got tempted into this process of starting a publishing company, uh, I guess motivated a little bit by Jeff Ullman's hope that you could actually make a little money in textbooks. I've given up on that idea. Uh, I think you don't, write, you don't write mainly for money. You write because you really want to say, you really want to put material together. And if money comes along, that's fine. But it can't be the primary aim. Uh, one can get uh, interesting comments from people. So for example, in this new book that Janessereth and I wrote with Paul Clay on the front, it's disappeared under all my ephemera here, this book, as I got started writing this chapter on non-monotonic reasoning because I got interested in, in things like circumscription. So I thought I had some result about circumscription that generalized uh, what was called predicate completion in some way or another. And I wrote this result up. This is sort of in the early stages of writing this book. I wrote this result up, and I sent it to John McCarthy, because he was the big circumscription person, right? So John McCarthy gives it to Vladimir Lifshitz. And Vladimir sends me a letter. This is before I'd even met Vladimir. I was still at SRI, August 13, 1984. He says, John McCarthy gave me a copy of your paper, A Generalization of Predicate Completion, that is ex entailed by circumscription, and so on and so forth. And in Vladimir's very polite way, it appears to me that there is an oversight in your proof. Well, there sure was. I mean, it was just plain old wrong, right? And so, <laughs> so it's very important to get this stuff out early. And then we gradually, I mean, you know, uh, you don't want to have the book published that way. Well, let's, uh, we're about out of time. Let me close with my last uh, statement, which is really to try to aim for excellence. I mean. This is a very, very tough point because you're never really going to get there. But you have to live with the idea that nevertheless, you're going to keep shooting for it. I mean, you never write the perfect thing. And here's another Hemingway, Hemingway uh, quote, uh, for example. 
this one a little in better taste than the last one. And that's true. I mean, you just keep working at it, you keep working at it, and eventually uh, things get better, but you always can find things to criticize. And people who uh, are, fan, anybody who's a fan of John McPhee, John McPhee wrote this book, something like The Making of a Birch Bark Canoe. And it was about someone who was very good at making birch bark canoes. And he was motivated by the idea that someday he was going to make the perfect birch bark canoe. Now, I don't know if he ever really believed that he was really going to make the perfect birch bark canoe or not, because I don't think he ever did. And I don't think anybody's written the perfect book. But that doesn't mean that you should say, well, since I can't write the perfect book, I'll be satisfied with mediocrity. Uh, you got to keep, keep after. So one of these days, I'm going to write the perfect AI textbook. I haven't done it yet. And uh, but I, you know, still got a few years I'm going to try uh, this. And so one of these days, I'll, I'll do it. So I guess we're out of time. Does anybody uh, have a question or two to summarize the last minute? Everybody will go out and write, write, rewrite, write, rewrite, write, rewrite, rewrite. Okay, thanks.